Morning. Morning. How many of y'all had a mother? Good. I just want to check on that. Well, it's the day when we celebrate motherhood and we thank the Lord for uh, these precious, precious souls who uh, were at the heart of our beginning. Uh, happy Mother's Day to you moms. And uh, congratulations to you dads. And uh, it's a great thing to have moms and dads and Christian families, isn't it? Wonderful thing to have families that know and serve and follow the Lord. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at a slightly different place in your Bible that I think you do not often turn to. It's not a book of the Bible that you're going to run to and say, I've got to see if I can find me an answer there. Uh, it's a very short letter written to an individual, and we'll get into that in a moment. It's called the book of Philemon, and you'll find it immediately after the book of Titus, where we have been for the last number of weeks. So if you get to First and Second Timothy, then you'll come to Titus, and then the next little book you'll come to is the almost one, sim- simply one page. Uh, I think one person called it a postcard from uh, the apostle uh, Paul to uh, his friend Philemon. Uh, and if you'll turn to that, you'll find it. I'm going to read the entire chapter and uh, just give you some commentary on it this morning that I hope will be helpful. The book of Philemon. It's on page 1425. <laughs> Whatever's in your Bible. Okay. Everybody found it? Okay. Sometimes you thumb through and you find, you, just, you can turn one page and miss this little book because it's just about a page long is all there is. 25, I think, or so, yeah, 25 verses. Let me read it for us. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. To our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, <clears throat> whom I have sent again, there, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, uh, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or uh, oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me uh, also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, 
Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now that's the letter. Let's bow together as we pray and we'll, by the grace of God, look into it. Let's pray. Our Father, as we bow in your presence again, we come to thank you for this good day. To thank you, Father, for those precious memories that we all have of which Brother Jim sang. Precious memories of family and uh, f- home. And uh, particularly do they center around the memories of our mothers. And we honor them today, Lord, uh, even as you would have us do. For you told us in your word to honor our fathers and our mothers. And, and that we're doing that today, Father. But more than that, we are here to honor our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, that in these moments as we look at this letter written so long ago uh, to a very special friend of the Apostle Paul's, may we learn from it those principles of truth that you've recorded in it for us and for our learning. We're reminded, Lord, that you've given us this promise that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable unto us. And so we pray that you'll bring to us the profit from this little letter and that we will leave this place helped and encouraged and strengthened because we spend a few moments in this very personal uh, and encouraging letter. To that end, we pray that Jesus may be honored and glorified. And Father, that you'll be pleased, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Amen. Now this letter, Philemon, is a short letter. uh, And it's written to a prominent slave owner by that name, uh, Philemon. And uh, he was also Paul's beloved friend and companion uh, in the ministry. Uh, He was probably uh, a very wealthy supporter of Paul's ministry uh, and may have been a pastor or an elder uh, in a church in the area called Phrygia. Uh, I was mentioning to Dempsey a little bit earlier that there are two churches in the Phrygia area where Philemon lived that were close by to one another. One of them was a church at Laodicea. The other was a church at Colossae. And so the letters to the the, uh, church at Colossians was written uh, in the very neighborhood where uh, Philemon lived. And he probably was an elder or or perhaps even a pastor in that church or in the Colossian church and may have served in both of them at at one time or another. In this little letter, Paul is asking Philemon to receive back into his household and unto himself Uh, a man by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus had been in Philemon's household as a slave. And he has now run away from that household. He's deserted his responsibilities there. He has robbed uh, Philemon uh, of goods. And uh, he has been uh, not only deserter of his responsibilities and stolen from his owner, but uh, he has uh, been generously, generally worthless. Now understand that as we re- represent this, this is the, by no means to say that God's word underlines and supports and strengthens the practice of slavery. That would be a wrong interpretation. The fact is that it speaks to the contemporary situation, which is, was in, in those days of Roman uh, occupation of that entire land, that slavery was a very common practice and uh, sometimes the very object of warfare was to take prisoners who would then be reduced to slaves uh, in the culture. Now that's not to say that God's word embraces it, but it does give us some principles about how people are to relate to one another as Christians. Well, at any rate, uh, this letter stands as a letter of instruction to us on how Christians are to respond to those who come to salvation after they have committed the crimes of hurt and pain and suffering and even robbery. Uh, Sometimes people don't come to the Lord until they are apprehended and they are caught in their crime and in their misbehavior. And when they have to then start to give an account, they come to recognize that they are lost, that they need a Savior. Now, we're going to learn that uh, as we go through the, the letter, that uh, there is a response that Paul is going to teach Philemon as to how he should respond to this man who has been in his household, been a trusted servant, and has now 
uh, betrayed them and left them and robbed them and run away from the responsibilities he carried on in the household of Philemon. So let's look at it now when I walk you through verse by verse. Keep your Bibles open and follow along with me. Now in verse 1, of course we meet Paul and he introduces himself uh, as a bond slave. But really he calls him, a bond slave is normal for him. He calls himself the due loss of Christ, the bond slave of Christ. But in this particular passage, he calls himself the prisoner of the Lord. And he was both a prisoner of Rome and a prisoner of Jesus at the same time. And along with Paul, he mentions the fact that Timothy is with him. Now remember when we did First and Second Timothy, we reminded ourselves of how Timothy was the understudy of Paul and how Paul encouraged him as a young man in ministry. So this is a letter from Paul and Timothy uh, to uh, Philemon, uh, who he calls a fellow laborer in the kingdom ministry. Now in verse 2, you meet some other names. In verse 2, you meet a person called Aphia, and uh, it's believed, though it's not certain, that she may have been Philemon's wife. But her name is mentioned in juxtaposition to a man by the name of Archippus, and Archippus was also an elder and a valued servant in the Lord. And so we don't know for sure whether she was Philemon's wife or, or the wife of Archippus, but uh, she is the female in this picture, so he takes moments to acknowledge her and to recognize her as a, as a friend and a valued servant of the Lord. And so he also mentions the fact that the church meets in their house. Now, we don't know whether it was in Philemon's house or whether it was in Archippus' house, but in one of those two houses, and maybe within both those houses, a group of believers met and learned and grew. Now, you need to remember that it was really late in the first century before churches began to have their own properties and began to actually build buildings for the people to come together and to meet in. The early church movement uh, in the New Testament was a house movement. Churches met in uh, believers' homes. And uh, this is why it talks about them breaking their bread from house to house. They actually met in homes and they had house churches. And so he greets the church there that's in the house of those two. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, Archippus is probably an elder pastor in either Colossae or uh, Laodicea. We don't know which, but uh, their names are mentioned in other places, uh, seemingly in those kinds of contexts. Now, in verse 3, he gives them the normal apostolic greeting, and he, he recognizes them as fellow believers. He's writing to Philemon and Archippus and uh, uh, Aphia, and uh, he says to them, grace and peace uh, uh, and uh, benediction. And he uses very strong biblical words. Now, we, we throw, you know, we, we learn church, we learn churchanity. And we learn church vocabulary. And we learn words that are predominant and prominent in scripture and we use them oftentimes without stopping to think about what they really are about for example the word grace we we even name our children grace sometimes you know but the word grace is a very special word in scripture significant for us to really lay hold of uh, the word grace has to do with god's special favor it has to do with not only with favor but with particular blessing and the, the nature of the favor of God and the blessing of God is such in the, the, the definition of the word grace that that favor and that blessing from God's hand is never deserved and it's never earned. You know, you hear people say, well, I just want to get what's coming to me. Dear friend, I want to tell you, you do not ever want in the presence of God to get what's coming to you. May I say this respectfully? Not meaning to hurt anybody's feelings or to insult you, but I can tell you the truth about this crowd that's here today, starting with this man and with every person in this room that hears me. If every one of us got what we deserved apart from the grace of God, we'd every one die and go to hell. Do you understand that? We come into this world as fallen creatures, parented by fallen creatures, lost and undone and uh, guilty of sin, uh, 
the psalmist went so far as to say, in sin did my mother conceive me. And so we don't come into this world and learn to sin. Have you ever noticed that parents, moms particularly, you never did have to teach your kids how to lie. You had to teach them not to lie, right? You didn't have to teach them how to be selfish. You had to teach them not to be selfish, correct? All right, yeah. And so you understand when we were raising our children, there was ever more the present evil tendencies in them that we tried to mitigate against. Now, so uh, grace is that very special favor and blessing that is never earned and never deserved. And then he says not only grace but peace. And this was a, a kind of a formula that Paul uses in a lot of his letters. Grace and peace, grace and peace. And so it's a peace. And he said, may both of these be uh, your heritage. And when the Bible speaks of peace, there are two predominant ways in which the expression is used. One of them has to do with the peace of God. And it, like grace, the, the phrase that you find in Scripture, the peace of God, has to do with the peace that comes from God. It's a gift of peace that God gives in the heart. Uh, and that's the heart that knows the full and complete forgiveness. And when Paul speaks about peace, the peace of God, he's talking about the heart that is now settled and is secure in the forgiveness and keeping of God. Uh, you, you may have known, you may can now remember how the burden of sin was upon you before you came to the Lord Jesus and how broken over your sins and how brought to a state of repentance by the work of the Spirit of God, you came to confess your sins and acknowledge your sinfulness and ask the Savior to forgive you. And when the sins were rolled away and the sins were washed away and you had the profound sense of forgiveness, there came a wonderful peace that those things that you remembered against yourself before are no longer brought to memory now. It's all gone past and it's done. That's the peace of God that knows full and complete forgiveness. But then there's another phrase in Scripture. It's not only the peace of God, but it's peace with God. It's a different preposition. Peace, uh, peace with God. Uh, you find that summarized in Paul's statement in the book of Romans, where he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. They will, as a result of being in Christ Jesus, not walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. And so he gives us the heritage of what it means to be a child of God and to be a Christian. And he just expresses this benediction on those to whom he is writing grace and peace. And that grace and peace, he makes very clear, is from the Father and from the Son. Now, now with that said, let's go to verse 4. Because here Paul begins to tell these dear loved ones to whom he is writing about how he prays for them. Uh, and he says that in prayer for gratitude, he is grateful to them, praying for them uh, and for their personal and ministry gifts to him. In verse 5, he is also grateful for their love for the Lord Jesus and for the Lord Jesus' people. And I wonder how often we take the time to say to our Father, Father, thank you for your people. And thank you that we have the privilege of associating with his people. Uh, I've, I've had questions asked me about uh, things like, uh, uh, how long have you been a preacher? And I tell them, well, how long have you been in ministry? That many years? Yep, all those years. Uh, from the time I was uh, 18, 19 years old, preached my first sermon right on through until today, six, 86 years old. That's been a while. And uh, they say, well, that's been tough, hasn't it? I said, hard times, rough places, no doubt. Walking with people through some of the most difficult things you could imagine. Uh, something comes to mind. Fayetteville, North Carolina. I was there. A mother comes to me weeping. I mean, comes into the office weeping. And I know something's bad wrong. I said, what's going on? And she comes in, sits down. She says, and she calls his name. Her 18-year-old son is in jail. And mama's broken hearted. What's he doing in jail? Well, he's gotten involved with some people. And they found him in those days with marijuana. And they put him in jail. And I don't know what to do. She was a single mother. And so she's broken hearted over her son. So here we are as a church having to try to help her help this boy of hers who's gotten on the wrong side of the tracks. 
And I could multiply that by hundreds of experiences of people in great difficulty and great problems. Uh, and, uh, and so sometimes we need to think in terms of praying for these of our family, those in our church family. And I would tell you something if, in case you don't know about this. If you today could stand where I'm standing, look out at this group of people, and you could go down with each face and each person, and if you've known them for four or five years, three or four years, whatever, you could say, I know a little bit about what you're going through. I know a little bit about what you're going through. I really identify with you. All right. And then I could look back here at this lady and I could say, her husband's in rehab. She's just gone through a tough week with Brother Harry, uh, not knowing what's going to be up or down. Uh, my special little couple over here have little Luke, you know, and I can go with each one of you because it's been my joy and it's been my pain as a pastor to know about those things you struggle with, right? Those things that are heavy on your heart that you're dealing with. Those difficulties, those mountains, difficulty hill that Pilgrim had to climb. And you're climbing your difficulty hill as well. And so this matter of prayerful gratitude and praying for their personal ministry and testimony, as you get to verse 6, uh, and before that he stoked to them about their love for the Lord Jesus and for his people. And, and it's a great thing that we're to pray for one another, pray for the saints of God. I don't know if you've thought about this lately. Uh, it, was, it was brought to mind to me within the last two weeks. Uh, that, you know, when you look at your Bible, particularly your New Testament, you know, we're, we're constantly talking about how we want to see lost people saved and we want them to hear the Word of God. But do you understand that like 98% of all the New Testament was not written to the lost world? It was written to save people. It wasn't written about lost people except to mention their terrible plight and encourage them to come to Christ. But all the rest of it was written to you and to me who are believers in the Lord Jesus. This is a personal book from God to us and how we ought to pray for one another as Paul is doing here, praying for them. As you get to verse 6, he's praying for their personal ministry, for their testimony, for it to be effective, and that their ministry and and testimony is revealing the very special spiritual benefits that are theirs because they have been brought into right relationship with the Lord Jesus. And in verse 7, Paul talks about the fact that uh, there's great joy and comfort uh, as he thinks about them and as he speaks about their special love toward him and all the believers who have received great help from, th from Philemon and from them. Now, and when you get to verse 7, I want to point out something to you that you may find helpful. In verse 7, uh, he uses a term, and it's a, a term that is out of date for us. We don't use it this way. We, in fact, we have different definitions for the same word. In verse 7, and in verse 12, and in verse 20 of this little short letter, verse 7, verse 12, and then again in verse 20. In each of those verses, he talks about bowels, as it's translated in the King James Version. And we do not use that term in that way. And you say, well, that's a strange way to talk. What is he talking about? Well, let's read those verses. Look at verse 7 first. In verse 7 he says, and uh, let, me, let me get, I've lost my Bible. Here we go, here we go. Verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Look at verse 12. Whom I have sent again, that thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. And then look at verse 20 again. What does he say there? Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Now, we don't talk like that today. That's just a different word altogether. Well, what does that have to do with? Uh, I had a missionary friend a number of years ago who worked with Wycliffe Bible translators, and he was in the Amazon basin most all of his missionary life. And he had to go to a tribe. They lived there for some three or four years. And he was constantly having some of the elders of the tribe teach him the tribal language. And he then had to reduce that tribal language to uh, 
a, a written language, and he used phonetics. That is to say, if they would say a word, he would try to get the right sound of the word and then use the letters that we use in our alphabet to describe that word so that he could write the word out and they could sound. He, in other words, he's taking a language that had never been written and making it a written language, and then he's going to translate the scriptures into that. That was his job. And they came to a passage where it talks about receiving the Lord Jesus uh, in your heart. And uh, so they would look at, the, the natives would look at him and say, why do you say heart? And he said, well, because that's what it is. And they say, oh, no, no. We do not love with our heart. We love with our liver. Now, this is a South American tribe. That they thought the seat of their affections was in the organ of their liver. You think, well, that's strange. No stranger than saying, I love you with all my heart. Your heart's a blood pump. So you're going to say to your sweetheart or to your wife or your husband, I love you with all my blood pump. Now, that really does sound great, doesn't it, Mike? I mean, that, that's romantic. If I ever heard romance, that's it. No, you don't talk like that. Well, that's the word bowel here. It really has to do with the inward man, the seat of the emotions. It is the place where strong feelings are held. Uh, Paul, in chapter 3 of the Ephesian letter, talks about bowels of mercy. And he's talking about a heart. We would call it a heart full of mercy. And as a closing verse in this particular little letter, if you look at the very last verse of the Philemon letter, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your, and then he has a different word here. He, he has the word pneumos. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The word spirit. And really, when he talks about bowels in these three verses, he's talking about the inward spirit that experiences love, experiences grace, and knows the Lord Jesus in the most intimate kind of way. And, and other than that, it's a, it makes for the reading a little clumsy for those of us who don't use the word bowel uh, in the way that it was used in 1611. And so <clears throat> with verse 7, he talks about how they're such a great blessing to him. And uh, this, this is the, y'all got that right? This is the place of heartfelt emotions. That's how we would describe it. The bowel here is the place in us of our heartfelt emotions. And so it's all right to say to your sweetheart, I love you with all my heart. To say to the one that shares your life, that one who is very special to you, I love you with all my heart. And you're not talking about your blood pump. You're talking about the seat of your deep feelings and your deep emotions. And so uh, with that uh, emotional heart, and, and it also connotes the idea that it's not just feelings, but they are sincere. Sincere meaning they're not mixed with, with antagonistic or opposite kinds of feelings, that they're true feelings. Uh, and after having this kind of an introduction up to this point, because all of this material in the letter is pretty much introductory, and it's, uh, it's setting the stage for what he's going to do. Now, Paul is writing a very difficult letter about a very difficult subject, and he's asking a big deal of a friend and a colleague in ministry and a fellow believer. And he begins in verse 8 to do that. I want you to stay with me now. He, and I'm paraphrasing, but in verse 8 he says something like this. I could be very bold, and I could command you to do what is fitting and proper. Now here, here Paul is pulling up his apostolic authority. Because at this point in his ministry and life, he has been recognized as one uniquely called and specially anointed by the Lord himself. And so he is recognized now as a later day apostle. And now he's bringing up that apostolic authority in verse 8. And he said, I could apostolically command that you do such and such and you'd be obliged to do it. That's what he says in verse 8. But I'm not going to do that, he says in verse 9. Rather, I lovingly request of you. <laughs> and I love this next part, Brother Tommy. He says, remember, I'm an old man. I'm the old man Paul. I'm Paul the aged. Now, you ought to take a little bit of sympathy on me. You ought to be a little bit compassionate toward me. You ought to help me up and down the stairs, and when I fall, pick me up and dust me off. I'm getting old. 
Anybody else besides me and Tommy like that? Never mind. Anyway, he says, I'm Paul the aged. And I'm an old soldier. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom I'm suffering my, the loss of my freedom, I'm asking you to grant this request. Now, did you ever know anybody that would come to you and tell you some things that would get you to sympathetically identify with them? Yeah. Do, do you ever see anybody in the fellowship and immediately you have a sympa, what the Latin calls sympatho, you have a, this sympathetic identity with them? Do you? Sure. Well, I do that with a bunch of you here, different ones that I know who've gone through certain kinds of trials and testings, and I sympatho with you in my heart. I truly do. And uh, I could point you out, but I won't do that. But the point is that uh, uh, he is saying to them, uh, to, to Philemon in verse 9, I, the old soldier, the prisoner, uh, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm in prison. I, in verse 10, he said, I beseech. The word there is to entreat. It's the word to almost persuasively beg. I ask you for your mercy. And then he uses a very intimate phrase here in the middle. For my son Onesimus. You see it there? That's what he's saying. He said, I'm making you a request for my son Onesimus. And whom I have led to Christ for salvation. So here's, here's the way this thing has worked out. And you have to use some spiritual understanding for background. At some point, and we do not have the record of when or where, after Onesimus ran away from the household of Philemon, a, a, a runaway slave, and he's trying to find refuge somewhere. He may have had to go into a Christian soup line. We don't know. But somehow or another, he, God brought Onesimus and Paul together. Paul shared with him the gospel and showed him that no matter what his status was in life, he was a sinner and he needed to be saved. And he came to Christ savingly. Onesimus was born again through his contact and ministry with the apostle Paul. And so he tells us this in verse, nine, verse 10. I beseech you, I entreat you, I ask for your mercy toward my son Onesimus. He is one whom I have begotten in Christ and who has become to Christ for salvation. Now he does this too in verse 11. As you move through, he, in verse 11 he says, I realize that before he came to Christ, and before I met him and knew him, says Paul, he was a most unprofitable servant to you. And the word Onesimus, by the way, happens to mean profitable or beneficial. And so he has been everything but profitable and beneficial to Philemon. And so Paul says, I realize that before he was most unprofitable to you, and that he was a stubborn, rebellious, problematic servant, and not worth very much to you. Now, any of you ever been on anybody like that? I have. I was like that myself before the Lord turned my life around. And you were like that. You were like that too, to some degree and in some measure. He said, I realized that there was a before, but then he says, but now he has become profitable to you and to me. Verse 11. He was not before worth much, but now he's become worth a great deal. Before he was unprofitable, but now he is profitable. Before he was be no help to us in kingdom work, but now he has become part of the kingdom. He's our brother in Christ, and he's a great servant of the Lord. And he'll be profitable to both you and to me. Now in verse 12, he says, I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending him home. I'm telling him, look, Onesimus, you ran away. You left a mess back there. You got to go back there now and straighten it out. You got to go back there and fix it up. Now, look here, all of you look up here a moment. There are some things that occur in your life where you wind up being on the side of the offender and the sinner. And there's some of those things where you, as you get right with God and as you walk in right fellowship with God, you have to go back and make it right. 
You have to go back and make it right. And it's a hard thing to do when you have to face up to this, that, or the other, and you have to go back and say to somebody, I messed up. I didn't do the thing like I should have done. Would you please forgive me? Knowing that you have the forgiveness of God in Christ, but you have offended someone else, and you need to make it right with God. I had an experience like that when I was in my late 20s many years ago. won't go into all the details, but it plagued me for more than a year until finally one day I just said, I don't care how many miles I have to drive, I've got to go take care of this thing. And I went back to a man who had been a member of my church, and he'd, he had set himself up to, to make sure that I didn't stay the pastor of the church very long, and we got at odds with one another. Now, I know that Christian brothers aren't supposed to get at odds with one another, but he and I did. And uh, uh, I happened to make the mistake of sharing with a friend uh, about this man and the fact that he was undercutting ministry everywhere I went. And uh, this friend got on the phone and called him and uh, did not identify himself, but told him, man, you leave the pastor alone, you do this. And he really, he kind of took my fight to that man. And so the man was very distressed about it. He just... But he never didn't know who made the phone call. He just listened to it. I knew who made the phone call, but I didn't tell him that I knew who made the phone call. So two years later, I'm at a Bible conference, and the Lord just really visits me about this whole thing. Kermit, you didn't do right by that man. Yeah, he was a problem. He was a pain. He, 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 was, he was one of those difficult saints that you have trouble getting along with. Any of y'all ever met anybody you couldn't get along with? Anybody lied about it? Yeah, we all have, haven't we? There are some people who are almost difficult, aren't they? There are some people who are hard. That's why Paul said, as much as it's possible, and as much as it lies within you, be peaceable with all men. And he seemed to be saying, Mike, that there's sometimes when it's a very difficult task to do. Well, at any rate, when the Lord finally spoke to my heart about that, I had to drive about 130 miles one way from where I was in that conference in Asheville down to Fayetteville, North Carolina, called a man ahead of time, met with him, and went to him and told him what I just told you, that I knew who called you. I didn't put the man up to it. I didn't ask him to call you, but he did. And it's been on my heart ever since, and now I want to ask you to forgive me for not coming clean with you. So, you know, it, it, several years had gone by. Well, he just, he said, don't worry about it. It's fine. Nothing wrong. Everything's good. I'm good. So our fellowship was restored, our relationship was restored, and what had been a difficult person in my life became a friend in my life. So I'm just telling you that when he says, I am sending him back to you, he's sending Onesimus into a very difficult situation because he's got to own up to the fact that he ran away, which was against the law. He stole from Philemon, which was against the law. And uh, he, he deserted all the responsibility that had been given him as a servant in the household of what was probably a very wealthy man. And he left all of that work that was to be done undone. And so he's just left behind him a mess. And now he's got to walk back into that mess and ask forgiveness of all the different people he offended and he treated in ill fashion. Uh, and as a Christian, he has a new set of values. But that's not the whole of the story. The other side of the story is that there are those people who were fellow servants of his. They were in the same boat he was in, and they were faithfully at work in the master's house. And he has run away, and this makes their task that's much more, much more difficult. They're the family members who had come to trust Onesimus, but now they, they, their trust has been betrayed and shattered. And so not only is he going back to have to make things right himself, but now they've got the, the task of doing what? Of responding to him and receive him in a godly fashion. Now I want to say this to you. Sometimes we just simply say about those who give us a hard time, well, I don't care what happens to them. I just assume they get out of my life and I never see them again. And we dismiss them and write them off. When in fact, if they were to come back to us, we now have a difficulty in the fact that we're enjoined in Scripture to receive them as we would receive someone loved as, the, as Philemon loved the Apostle Paul himself. So when he says, I'm sending him back to you, therefore receive him as though he was my own heart. 
That, that's the way he does that in verse 12. Now look with me at verses 13 and 14. And he says in substance these words. It would have been a great help to me just to keep Onesimus with me because in my bonds as a prisoner of the Lord, he has been extremely helpful. He has really been a great help to me. And it would have been fine for me to keep him with me so that in your place, he could have helped me and ministered to me in my captivity. And I'm in captivity because of the gospel. But he said, uh, even though it seems that I was tempted to do that. I knew that that wasn't the proper thing to do. And so I'm going to send him back to you. Let me read it for you uh, in verse 12. Uh, he says, Whom I have sent again, that thou therefore receive him, that is, my own heart and my own life and my own uh, inward love. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit uh, should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. And so he says, I'm sending him back to you, even though he would have been a great help to me, but I would not keep him to help me without your permission. And he's, he's your property. He belongs to you. Uh, and and you, uh, you have to receive him because I'm sending him back to you. Uh, and then we go to verse 15. Now notice what Paul says. He departed from you as a slave. Perhaps that came about so that he could come home to you as a brother. And he'll be your brother forever. And it seems like that Paul has a, an eternity in mind here. When he comes back, he says in verse 16... Don't receive him and tolerate him as though he were just a slave, a bad behavior slave, but receive him as a beloved brother. You will see him, in verse 16, not as a servant, not as a slave, but above a servant. His status has greatly improved and it's changed. He's not what he used to be. He has now become your special brother to you and to me. And he will be a great help to us both. So what is Paul saying? He's saying oftentimes the people who are a thorn in our side, they're a pain. And if you haven't run into folks like that who are a pain, then either your nervous system isn't working or you have yet to have that experience. Because there's some folks who are just absolutely difficult to deal with. Any of you know about that? Well, sure you do. Thanks, Brother Jim. Appreciate the affirmation. You know that's true. Yeah. And yet, something happens. What happened here? Onesimus runs away, steals from Philemon deserts his responsibility. And yet Paul says, you know what? It may be, he uses a perhaps here, it may be that that occurred so that after he leaves you, he could later come back home to you, verse 16, as a brother. Not a, as a bad behavior slave, but he can return to you happily as a beloved brother. And you will see him above a servant. A special servant to me and to you. Uh, ask you this question. Think about it. Have you ever had a situation which uh, was bad? This occurred and that occurred and this occurred. And you can see no purpose or reason in it at all. And it doesn't make any sense to you. But then later on, some other things develop. And you say to yourself, well, that would have never been able to develop if this other had not happened. And so what I sometimes see as a disaster or a catastrophe or something gone wrong or something bad occurring, and I don't see any point or reason behind it, yet there is the perhaps that God is letting that occur. The Father is directing that to, to, 
to become part of your experience so that something else then can by that be set up to be your experience of blessing. Have you ever seen it? That's what Paul's dealing with here as he gets to uh, verses 15 and following. He departed from you perhaps so that he could come home to you as a brother in Jesus. And, and look at verse 16 where he says, Not as a servant will he come home, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, specially to me, and how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now in verse 17, he really puts the responsibility on to Philemon. He says, If you count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. The kind of welcome that you would give to me if I were coming to your home. Give that same welcome to Onesimus. He's already called him his son and his beloved brother. And he says, receive him as you would receive me. Now let's go to verse 15. I'm sorry, verse 18. In verse 18 he says this, If he has wronged thee or owes you anything, put that on my account. Isn't that something? Put it on my account. I'll, I'll see to it that the, the accounts are squared away. I'll, I'll make, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest me even thine own self besides. And he said, if you want to collect from me, guess what? If you think about it, I could collect from you. But I'll cover the debt if it's there. If he has defrauded you, if he's taken off from you, give it, put it on my account. There's something about that principle in Scripture where Paul says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Right? Let, let me just take that another step. Take it one more place. Someone comes to you and in the process of conversation, as you talk with a Christian brother or sister, they, uh, you know, it comes out and it's not in any way trying to manipulate you at all. But in the conversation you learn that they are facing a financial dilemma. They're coming up against a hard place and they don't have the wherewithal to take care of it momentarily. They've got a too much month at the end of the month. The money has run out before the month has finished. And so they're short. And so what do you do? You hear about that. You learn about that. What do you do about that? Say, tough luck. Wish you well. Bye. Or do you recognize that God has put an opportunity before you to do something that some people call extraordinary? And that is, if he needs a hundred bucks to get through till the end of the month, you make sure he gets the hundred dollars, right? If he needs three hundred to get to the end of the month, and you've got it, and it's not particularly pressing to you, whatever the case is, you make sure he gets the three hundred. You know, if that kind of ministry started happening in the church, we would be doing what? Bearing one another's burdens. And in so doing, we will fulfill the law of Christ. This is what Paul's doing here as he says, if he's wronged you, if he has uh, taken anything from, anything from you, put it on my account. I will repay it and uh, do that. Then he goes on in verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence uh, in, the, in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. Now look at the latter half of verse 21. I wrote to you with one certain knowledge, knowing that you will also do more than I say. Hmm, how's that? Do you know what that is that Paul is referring to here? It's what in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus described for us as the second mile principle. Somebody compels you to go with him a mile, go with him too. If somebody compels you to bear his burden, then pick up the burden and pick up the other part too and walk the distance with him. Go and bear one another's burdens. And so Paul says, I will repay it. And uh, I know this, 
that whatever I've required of you, verse 21, you're not only going to do that, but listen to it, you're going to do more than I say. I've asked you to do this, but you're going to do more than that. You're going to put the whipped cream on the top with the cherry. You're going to fix it up so that it really is great. You're going to make a difference here in this young man's life that only you can make. Now, you have to have a little bit of spiritual imagination here to think about what's going to happen when Onesimus comes walking back into the, the compound. He comes back into the big home. And uh, the servants at the gate and the servants in other places begin the rumor that he's coming home. Master has told us that Paul has sent a letter saying he's going to come home and now we've got to receive him. Can you imagine what that homecoming was like on the part of those who were there and on the part of that young man as he came back? Broken hearted over his failure, broken hearted over his sin, broken hearted over his offense to people that loved him and that uh, cared for him. And that he had served for a while and has not been a good servant. But now he's coming back to start again. To start again. I'll finish this up by simply having you look at the, we'll look at the last three, four verses in just a moment. But I want to say this to you. In my years of serving people, I've noticed that oftentimes great breaches and great breakdowns come in families. Brothers and sisters fall out with one another. Parents and children have controversy and fall out with one another. And they get to the point where, like Onesimus is separated from Philemon, they're split apart and there's no ground for them to get together. May, may, Matt, let me say this to you. Just, I'll just put it in plainest possible language. As long as that condition persists, your joy in the Lord will be profoundly affected and your effectiveness as a servant of God and as a witness for Christ will be affected. And so what is our responsibility? It is to find a way under the providence of God and under the leadership of God's Spirit to heal those breaches and to make a difference in the, the, where the gap is, to close the gap so that those who belong together can be together again. Those who walked together at one time can now walk together once again. And I don't know anything that's more important in the family of God than that sort of thing. Uh, Jesus said it this way, and, and I'll close with this. Jesus said that when you come to the Lord's table and you have ought against your brother, or you know that your brother has ought against you, that you're to go to your brother or your sister and make it right. And then come and bring your offering that you're presenting to the Lord. And I think sometimes in the modern church, we're very slow on that sort of thing. We don't much want to do that. But that's Onesimus coming home. That's facing up. That's dealing with the difficulty. And seeking and looking for the brokenness to be healed. And the bad relationship to be fixed. And uh, for once again, the love of Christ to rule over in the hearts of men and women in those situations. Now, unless I miss my guess, there's some folks here today who have gone through much brokenness. Had your heart broken by this one or that one or the other. And right now, if that name comes up, you have negative emotions. If that person comes up, you yeah. You have a throwaway mentality. And yet they are in Christ and you're in Christ. And the body of Christ should not be broken or fractured. So as much as it's possible, as much as it lies within you, make peace. Be reconciled. Let Onesimus come home. And when Onesimus comes home, let Philemon receive him. And yeah, you could say, well, you didn't do me right. Well, sure, that, that's why the, the breach is there. It needs to be repaired and fixed. And I will close with this for sure. David had a son. His son's name was Absalom. 
And Absalom tried to take over the throne, dethrone his father, so that he could become the king of Israel. And there was a rebellion. It was so bad that the major officers in David's army went to the palace and got David out and took him out and hid him so that Absalom could kill his own father. And when David regained his throne, they said, what do you want to do with Absalom? And he said, uh, just leave him. And then they later came and said, what are we to do about Absalom? He said, tell him he can come home. I'll forgive him. But he's not going to see my face. He's not going to come into my presence. Have been a place out there on the edge of things. Let him stay there. So he'll be a recluse in my presence. That's, that's what you call partial forgiveness. It's not forgiveness at all. But in Philemon's case and in Onesimus' case, Paul is saying nothing less than complete forgiveness, which is what grace is all about, will matter. Okay? So as, as you face your personal decision of making peace with this one or that one or the other, know that as you walk that trail that you're walking in the path that has been laid out for you in this little letter of making things right with God and with those others of your family who are in Christ. And as much as it's possible and as much as it lies within you, pursue that. If they put up the wall and they say nothing doing, then that's as far as you can go. But at least go that far. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're grateful to you that you are our Father and that we had to come home to you one day and cry out like the prodigal son coming home. We had to say to you, Father, I have sinned and I'm no more worthy to be called your child. Receive me as one of your servants. And you restored us as your full-grown children, full-blown children. You saved us and you cleansed us and you made us accepted in the Beloved. And you count us as your dear and precious treasure. So Father, I pray that there will be a new spirit of restoration and a spirit of coming home and a spirit of getting right with you and with others that we may be offended by or that we may have offended. And Father, I pray your spirit will speak to us about it, that we may get it straight and get it right and walk with you in peace and in grace. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.